Much has already been said about the state of Metal Gear Solid Master Collection Volume 1. The idea of this collection, on paper at least, is enticing enough. For £50 or $60, Konami offers up seven main entries in the series in one package. We get the PlayStation 1 Classic, Metal Gear Solid 1, with the VR missions pack included. We get the PS2 sequels, Metal Gear Solid 2, Sons of Liberty, and Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater, with enhancements from the later Substance and Subsistence versions. And looking back to the series roots, there's the MSX2 releases of Metal Gear 1 and Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake, plus the two Metal Gear games released for NES. In terms of coverage then, that takes us from the series inception in 1987 right up to MGS3 in 2004, with room for a Master Collection Volume 2 to expand beyond that. There are omissions, but it's enough, so long as each game gets a worthwhile update, so long as each is given the attention it deserves. Sadly though, this isn't the reality here. Regardless of which platform you buy the Master Collection on, and despite some nice extras on the front end, it could and should have been so much more. The bottom line is, the Master Collection presents Metal Gear Solid 1, 2 and 3 with limited enhancements over any previous release. The first MGS for example runs via an emulator at the same resolution and frame rate as the original PS1 hardware back in 1998. And then, MGS2 and 3 in this case boot up code based on the HD collection versions as first developed by Bluepoint in 2011 for Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. In fact, by using Bluepoint's HD collection of MGS2 and 3, with minimal changes as well, both games still run at a native 1280x720 in the Master Collection. Whether it's PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X or Nintendo Switch, 720p is all we get here. Even the PC release fixes at 720p for MGS2 and 3 with no official settings menu to boost the resolution, though there are workarounds there which I'll get to. All of this is despite suggestions from Konami before release via the spreadsheet that these games might target 1080p. In truth, it's disappointing to see just how bare bones the final result is. What are you waiting for? Shoot! Don't talk to me like a rookie! So here's what I've got. With so many games and platforms to cover, I'm honing in on PS5, Series X, Switch and PC today. All have issues, but some, notably Nintendo Switch, are much worse off in both visuals and frame rate. Now, there's no doubt plenty of other ways to split these comparisons, with a slew of minor differences potentially from previous releases, but I'll be summarizing the most major pitfalls of this collection today. So between the console versions, which is the best way to play MGS1, 2 and 3 in the Master Collection? Are there any other drawbacks besides that native 720p resolution on each? Next along, what's going on with the Nintendo Switch release, especially in terms of its frame rate in MGS2 and 3, which are both uniquely capped at 30fps? And lastly, what's the state of PC right now, and to what extent is it possible via mods or emulation to improve image quality for these games on 4K displays? Let's find out. Let's jump to the good news before we get to the bad. Credit where it's due, each game has a slick, responsive front-end menu, a portal built on the Unity engine that's crammed with extras. And it's here that the Master Collection shines. We get extensive language options before booting any game, we get a digital master book for each, breaking down every character and backstory. We get screenplays for all seven games, with MGS3 in particular impressively offering up a 900 page manuscript covering every cutscene and radio call. There are even these beautifully animated digital graphic novels for MGS1 and 2 complete with voice acting. And in Metal Gear Solid 1's case, we have every variation of the game on show. We get the main 1998 original game, the special missions expansion disc for Europe, VR missions for North America, and the Japan-only integral release. Seriously, for a Metal Gear completist, it's great to have all this conveniently packaged in one place. The only downside is that the Master Collection doesn't tie everything together with a single front end. Instead, to allow each game to be bought separately for £16 a piece, they're partitioned away as unique apps on the console system menu, which is a shame. So to start, and with all of that in mind, let's check out the very first Metal Gear Solid to see what's up here.
the original Metal Gear Solid in the Master Collection plays it very safe. It's running on PS5 in this case, but in truth, there isn't any difference in playing it on Switch, Xbox Series X, or PC. The reason being, MGS1 takes the straight emulation approach, with development on this portion of the collection being handled by developer M2. And as such, many of the quirks of the original PS1 game are preserved in software. We get the same base resolution of 240p, and of course PS1 signature a fine texture warping, causing texture maps to wobble in effect as you move the camera. In terms of the game's frame rate, the hardware clock speeds are simulated too, meaning it caps at 30 frames per second with hard drops to 20 FPS and under, usually in the first person view. But there is one big point here. If you buy the Master Collection in European territories, it seems to default to the European region PS1 version of the game, which is of course capped to 25 FPS to suit the 50Hz PAL standard. So selecting English UK, or in fact any European language from the game's front end, will boot this PAL version with a lower max frame rate. Hardly ideal. The good news is, the Master Collection also includes the North American NTSC version as an optional download, accessed by selecting the English US option as a language. And as with the PS1 original, this gives us a smoother 30fps cap with 60Hz displays in mind. Overall, while it is great we have both PAL and NTSC versions available, for the completest anyway, it is a shame that the NTSC US and Japanese releases involve an extra download. These two versions are highly recommended though, and really should have been the default ways to play. Sticking to the English US version, it's clear M2 and Konami opt for a no frills approach to the game itself. Besides the swapped button prompts to suit modern consoles and the various themes for the borders, there are no visual settings. There are no options to even scale the image or CRT filters to mask the PS1's dithered picture. Though at least, Konami has stated some video options in this vein are planned for a future update. For now, at least, the biggest downside is that the Master Collection's emulation here just doesn't scale the game's image well to 4K displays, and it really could be so much better. Here's genuine PS1 footage for example. This is clean, razor sharp capture, kindly supplied by John Linneman through his PS1 Digital and HDMI enabled original console. And yes, the core visuals are identical. It's just that the crucial point of image quality suffers in the Master Collection upscale. The definition of text, the clarity of 3D elements scaling from 240p, are muddied using M2's bilinear filtering here. Not only that, but the emulation of audio is also sadly inaccurate in this release. Listen close, and there are audio hiccups, a popping effect, as this submarine passes by, which is a common issue with emulating PS1's reverb effect. I'll play John's original PS1 capture first via the PS1 Digital, where sound is flawless, and then right after that I'll play the Master Collection version. The nuclear weapons disposal facility on Shadow Moses Island in Alaska's Fox Archipelago was attacked and captured by next generation special forces, being led by members of Foxhound. The nuclear weapons disposal facility on Shadow Moses Island in Alaska's Fox Archipelago was attacked and captured by next generation special forces, being led by members of Foxhound. All round, MGS1's delivery on modern day consoles leaves so much on the table, so much potential untapped. Even as an option, a native 1080p or 4K version of the game would have been a hugely welcome extra. Case in point, looking at PS1 emulators on PC like Duck Station, the results really do hold up surprisingly well I think. In comparison with Duck Station running at a native 4K on the right side, plus a fix for PS1's texture warping, we have just a glimpse of what could have been. Now I'm not expecting every console to hit this resolution in the Master Collection, but certainly 4K should be viable on PC, PS5 and Series X given the power on tap. As it stands though, 
MGS1 fans are treated to a huge wealth of great options in the Master Collection front end, the Masterbook, the script, and multiple versions. But the game itself, besides the button prompt changes, looks and plays much like it did back in 1998. The Metal Gear Solid 2 and Metal Gear Solid 3 parts of this Master Collection are where we see the biggest issues. In essence, both of these are the same as the HD Collection versions released in 2011 on Xbox 360 and PS3, and there's no real attempt to disguise the fact either. In booting either of these games, you'll even catch a flash of the old HD Collection logo in the bottom right. So with that in mind, the content of each game is much the same as it was on PS3 and 360. The key exception being that the MSX2, Metal Gear and Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake games are siphoned off, removed from the MGS3 menus and put in their own separate app. Also, interestingly, there are certain benefits to playing Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3 from the Master Collection today. For one, the delay on codec dialogue in MGS2 has been reduced. Previously, in the HD Collection, the codec screen would pop up and hang in place for 3 seconds until the dialogue kicked in. But that wait is now thankfully reduced on PS5, Series X, Switch, and PC. Potentially then, Konami has gone in to tweak these games with the new opportunity to do so, and iron out a few other issues for the Master Collection. Jumping to the comparisons next, this is where the problems show up. Between Switch, Xbox Series X, and PS5, we know the score with its resolution, a native 720p for both MGS2 and 3, but that doesn't tell the whole story. The fact is, anti-aliasing quality differs between all three consoles, notably in Metal Gear Solid 2, where PS5 offers the most thorough treatment of rough edges. Now let's be honest, at 720p it's never going to be too flattering, but PS5 is at least the best of the bunch. So check out these panning shots of the oil rig with its hard geometric edges. Especially in zooming in, Nintendo Switch leaves all these edges entirely raw at 1280x720, they go untreated without any anti-aliasing whatsoever. It creates this heavy visual noise, flickering, especially in motion, and as for Series X in the middle, there's something unusual going on here, in that it finds a midway point between PS5 and Switch in terms of the quality of edge treatment. For example, see how in this panning shot, parts at the bottom of the image are clearly treated on Series X with a form of anti-aliasing. It reduces the moiré patterns and the noise. But then, the metallic lines at the top of the image are left raw just like Switch, with a similar flicker. All of this applies to MGS2, but the upside is, for Metal Gear Solid 3, all three consoles here do apply anti-aliasing across the board, so it's really MGS2 on Switch and Series X that stick out. Anti-aliasing goes in PS5's favour, but there's another twist in texture filtering. Check out this corridor in MGS2 with all those fine metallic details across the floor, and it shows a nisotropic filtering quality on PS5 is a big step up over Series X, which uses a lower quality filtering solution that turns all that detail into a blur. And meanwhile, on Switch, it's even worse. There's seemingly no texture filtering applied at all on Switch, turning this texture ahead into this pixelated noise as we turn the corner. The upside for Switch is, texture filtering is at least engaged in Metal Gear Solid 3, even if it uses the same low quality and isotropic setting as Series X here. Overall, across both Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3, PS5 ends up with the best image quality. It's a big advantage, especially in the third game where the camera is fully controllable, making it easier to spot the better texture filtering. Also, and this is an aside, I did notice Series X has this odd lighting bug during MGS3's opening scene. It seems to be missing the sunlight, which I couldn't replicate on PS5 or Switch. The anti-aliasing and texture filtering points urgently need fixing on Series X, and especially on Switch in MGS2. More to the point, it's a bizarre situation on Series X, 
given the master collection produces an often worse image than what we already had in the Xbox 360 HD collection, running in back and pat. So here's that comparison, and please excuse the slight difference in gamma between the two. It turns out running 360 games on Series X triggers a slight boost in black levels, but the comparison stands. It shows how these two visual issues in the Master Collection are fixed instantly if you're a Series X user. Anti-aliasing quality, for example, is better in the older HD Collection, and we even have superior quality texture filtering in place thanks to Series X retroactively forcing a high setting for 360 games. Going back to this 2011 version, clears up the game's presentation right away. From the presentation of MGS2's oil rigs to the clarity of the wood bridge in MGS3. In terms of performance, there are a few other disappointments. On the plus side first, MGS2 and 3 at least run at 60 frames per second on PS5 and Series X without much issue. Admittedly, cutscenes are designed to run at a mix of 60, 30 and 15 FPS at points in MGS2, notably in this first encounter with Vamp. These drops appear to be hard-baked design choices that carry over from the PS2 days, and Hideo Kojima appear to use frame caps for dramatic effect in character close-ups. It's a flourish that stays on modern consoles, but as far as the core gameplay goes, both games run at 60 frames per second. The situation on Nintendo Switch, though, is less encouraging. Whether played, docked, or as a portable, both MGS2 and 3 run with a 30 FPS cap. Obviously, that's a big setback next to the HD collection, which runs at 60 FPS on older 360 and PS3 hardware. And even on PS2, the original version of MGS2 was built to run at 60 frames per second. Perhaps the most glaring part is that this 30 FPS cap on Switch has a kind of domino effect on the game's motion blur effect too. Notably, in MGS2's opening tanker section, it causes more notable banding behind camera movement, which now of course refreshes at half the rate it was intended. So in this early boss battle, for example, any first person shooting turns the picture into this blurry mess. I'm glad to say the blur effect is at least disabled for the Raiden sections later on on the oil rigs and Metal Gear Solid 3. So at least the issue goes away there. For Nintendo Switch and its Tegra X1 chipset, there's clearly a bottleneck to getting either game running at 60 FPS. And to pile on the misery, there are issues on top of that 30 FPS cap. First up, it's an unevenly frame paced 30 FPS, with the frame time graph on the left side trilling between 16 and 50 milliseconds to create juddery movement. And then there's the drops below 30 FPS. Cutscenes in MGS2 again are the biggest culprit in my experience, but it may affect gameplay later. We're getting lurches into the low 20s in first meeting Fortune, for example, and 18 FPS in long shots of the oil rig. So Switch just isn't coping here. Oddly enough though, there are flashes of 60 FPS gameplay in MGS2 as well on Switch, specifically for any interaction with doors or lockers. This appears to be tied to the game logic itself, and as soon as we reach for a locker handle, the frame rate on Switch immediately unlocks to 60 FPS and even stays there while we're inside the locker. All of which is to say, the optimization on Switch is in a bizarre state as it stands. The sub 30 FPS drops at 720p with zero anti aliasing or texture filtering all show it needs a lot of work. And to be clear, the performance level while playing Switch as a portable isn't any better, with a similar low 20s reading during the same cutscenes. Most of these issues relate to MGS2 though, and the third game fixes a great many of these problems at least. Booting up the PC version of MGS2 and 3 in the Master Collection is perhaps the biggest shock of them all. After getting over the fact that this officially puts MGS3 on PC for the very first time, which is great, reality hits on booting the game. Again, we're looking at a fixed native 720p rendering of both games, just like on console. There's no settings menu for either game on PC, there's no way to adjust anti-aliasing, the rendering resolution, aspect ratios, or even your preferred output resolution. You only get a choice between windowed and borderless full screen. And as is the trend, 
the MGS2 portion on PC also has the bigger visual issues. Much like on Nintendo Switch, the entire image runs at 720p with zero anti-aliasing whatsoever, creating a busy, noisy image. Thankfully, anti-aliasing is applied in MGS3 at least, but then again, both games use a very low quality pass of anisotropic filtering here. It's very similar in quality to Series X's implementation and smudges all texture detail at an angle. And again, there's no in-game toggle to change it on PC. If there's one redeeming part to the PC release, it's that we have the flexibility to fix some of these problems ourselves. So to start with the easiest fix, the Nvidia and AMD control panels of course let us override the game's own texture filtering setting, bumping it to 16 times instead. Added to that, a modder named Serge Anor has devised a fix to force both MGS2 and 3 to run at a native 4K, or any resolution in fact. This involves a simple copy-paste of a couple of files to each game's direct Directory, and then editing the .ini file from there lets you set any value right up to 3840 by 2160. In comparison with the game left at its default 720p speaks for itself. Running at 4K with 16x anisotropic filtering completely fulfills the expectations I had of not just the PC release, but also PS5 and Series X. It's an absolute breath of fresh air seeing Metal Gear Solid 3's busy forest areas sharpen up with 9 times the pixel output. Sadly though, there is a catch. Tweaking the resolution like this causes the HUD overlay to break, alongside post effects like blur. Still, the 4K mod proves a proper, official 4K option could, and perhaps should have been prioritised by Konami itself. And this is just scratching the surface on PC in terms of mods, with new efforts like upscale texture packs and more appearing by the day since its release. Metal Gear Solid Master Collection Volume 1 is a disappointment then, but it's not without merit. There's something to be said for having all these classics in one convenient package for today's consoles and PC. The front end menus are a highlight, the extra content for each game is neatly laid out on each, and in MGS1's case, we're given the rare luxury of choice between multiple versions of the same game. The table of contents isn't the issue. Rather, the problems start after booting into the action, where there's really little ambition to update these games for modern hardware. It's a basic, emulated effort for the PS1 Metal Gear Solid, while MGS2 and 3 are based heavily on the aging HD collection. Ultimately, I did expect MGS2 and 3 to be presented at more than just 720p. And looking at Switch, it's a shame 30fps is enforced here, with frame rate drops below that as well. Most disappointing of all though is PC, which offers no visual settings menu whatsoever. Being stuck at 720p with zero anti-aliasing makes it the least excusable release of the Master Collection and it's in dire need of attention. Looking to the future, at least Konami has already promised updates to address several issues. Notably, it's already flagged multiple bug fixes, the cutscene performance in MGS2, adding a true full screen and window toggle on PC, plus CRT and aspect ratio options in select games. And given the extent of the issues across all three games in the Master Collection, I really hope this is only the beginning. That the scope of future patch updates goes even further before we get even near to Volume 2's release. But that's all for me today. If you did enjoy this video, feel free to like or subscribe, and don't forget to hit that bell for instant notifications as any new video lands. To get a high quality version of this video, check out our Patreon at digitalfoundry.net, and to get in touch directly, you know where to find me. But for me for now, thanks for watching.